Hello there, welcome back to the channel, and today we're going to be looking at one of the power players of one of the greatest civilizations in the galaxy. A family of men and women who had, for better or worse, some of the greatest influence on the Klingon Empire for over 200 years and counting. And that would be the Duras family. Now, Klingon politics can be a murky quagmire of intrigue, treachery, and violence. Despite their reputation for honor, numerous times the Klingon High Council has basically been caught with its, you know, pants down and its hand in the cookie jar, asking to be spanked just a little bit harder by their Romulan adversaries. So, every civilization has its darker side. Not everyone that is in charge should be. Now, the basic framing of the Klingon government is there is a chancellor and a high council. Now, the first council was actually formed by Kalis. Kalis was effectively the Klingon Messiah, the Klingon Jesus, for lack of a better term. Although not truly a messianic figure, he was certainly very powerful and similar to Jesus, who had a great influence on Western culture, and Surak, who had a great influence on Vulcan culture. He was very influential in Klingon history and culture. And although he would be the first and effectively last emperor, sort of, the High Council that he created would go on, although it would routinely be disbanded and would be reforged in the 23rd century. Truly reforged anyway. But effectively, it was made of several very powerful Klingon houses, including one, the Duras family. And being part of a powerful lineage and powerful dynasty doesn't necessarily make one suited to being in charge. Look at monarchies. Not every king and queen has been truly suitable to rule. There have been many exceptions, men and women who were schooled, educated and raised to be in charge. They grew up in an environment where they were exposed to the intrigue and they simply flourished. And others faltered. Henry VI, for example, of England, being an example of someone who was simply not prepared for leadership. Whereas, to quote, look at another Henry, Henry II or Henry VIII or Henry VII, were all actually good, might be the wrong word, effective leaders. Now, I'm using British monarchy simply because I'm most familiar with it being British myself, but you get the idea. Duras was not necessarily a family that should be in charge, but from perceptual, from the common folk of the Klingon Empire, they seem like good, honorable, decent Klingons, and, you know, that's sometimes all it takes for a large group of people to see someone in charge and think that is the man or the woman or the person for me because they are saying the things I want to hear them say. They're promising to restore the glory of the Klingon Empire. They're going to crush our enemies and make us feared once again across the Alpha and Beta Quadrants. And that's exactly what they want to hear. But in reality, the Duras family were actually in bed with their sworn enemy the Romulans. They were working with their enemy to help their enemy advance its goals, because the Duras family were only interested in making themselves more powerful. They were only interested in power and control of the masses, and the masses handed them that power quite often, as we often see, as they have quite a lot of followers, because there was money to be made, because there was power to have, because they said the right thing, or because they simply believed the bull or the Targ, in the Klingon's case. Now, everywhere has these kinds of people who, quite frankly, should never be placed in charge. This cock nugget, for example. But, I digress. We are going to start looking at exactly who the Duras family were, are its members, and what influence they had over the Klingon Empire, and where it all started. The effective founder of House Duras himself was actually a fairly disgraced individual. Son of Jarod in the 22nd century, Duras, the first one we know about, became the head of House Duras. Quick edit, son of Toral. My bad. A very influential house, but he became something of a disgraced Klingon when he was defeated in battle by a human, from basically from a race that Klingons had no respect for at the time, very little knowledge of, and were new players on the galactic scene. He was defeated in battle by a human, Jonathan Archer. This disgraced him. He was given an option uh, for redemption, 
and him and his ship with a few followers and hangers on went after the NX-01 Enterprise, a single Earth vessel, something that should have been easily, from a Klingon point of view, defeated by three birds of prey, was actually overwhelmed and defeated. Two vessels withdrawing as they'd entered the Delphic Expanse because those Klingons weren't insane, while Duras continued to pursue the humans into the Expanse, resulting in Archer going, had enough of this, sick of Duras, got better things to do than deal with you, you've had your chance, and he got his ass thoroughly handed to him with a volley of potent torpedoes, and boom, his bird of prey was destroyed, and that, in essence, was the end of the first head of the House of Dora. With his death in 2153, we don't really know much about what happened, but clearly the house continued on. When next we really hear about the Duras family, this is the first time we really see them as traitors. Now, the first Duras, the founder of the family, in no way was actually a traitor. He was disgraced, yes, but only disgraced in a sense from a human point of view, which was stupid. He was defeated in battle. It happens. But they take it personally. They're Klingons. They're going to Klingon, right? So he's defeated, disgraced. But in the 2340s, Jarrod, the head of the Duras family at the time, was essentially seen as an ally of House Moog, but he actually betrayed them, resulting in the Kidama massacre and the Moog family actually being blamed. Worf ended up exiled, and this would be a recurring problem for Worf. Again, this whole thing of the Klingon High Council having to save face, and Klingon having to, and uh, Worf rather, having to accept this commendation and exile from the Klingon Empire as a result to protect the name of Duras because the Duras family was very well respected. Now, Jared himself was killed in this attack, but his son and two daughters that we know of would continue on. His son, Duras, would make a play for the head of the Klingon High Council. Kimpek was dying, as we would learn through poisoning, a very dishonorable and non-Klingon way of killing someone. This poison was Romulan, given to him by a Romulan ally and assassin. Now, Kimpek knew that someone was trying to kill him. It was either Gauron or it was Duras. So it was one of them. Now, Worf, knowing what he knew, and Kim Peck, also knowing this, suspected, but could not confirm. Both men at the time looked suspicious. They could either one have been guilty. Of course, Worf automatically assumed Duras, and to be fair, he was correct. Duras was slowly, or at least getting one of his allies, to poison Kim Peck so that he would die. This would result in the position becoming open. It also resulted in a short Klingon civil war, just showing how powerful House Duras was. Gauron, however, was a politician, while Duras was something more of a soldier. And in the ensuing war, Gauron was on the back foot. He was losing. Duras was winning. But when Duras came after Worf's Pamakai, he was less than pleased. Finding out Duras had assassinated her, he would go after him. He would beam off the Enterprise, challenge him to a duel, and ultimately kill him, as Duras, again, was no war. I mean, fuck, who is it? Unless you're a blue barrel, you're dead. You're dead. That's it. And Duras, that was the end of Duras. And it ultimately allowed Gauron to take power. Ironically, many years later, Worf would also kill Gauron, allowing Martok to become Chancellor, turning down the position himself. You know. Worf, the decider of chancellors, apparently, should be his title. So, that's not the end of House Duras, because remember, he had two sisters, and we would find out an illegitimate son, Toral, as they like to reuse names. It's something that is introduced with the Duras family. We see that actually you get effectively like, um, well, going with the Henry analogy from earlier, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. You can actually have that sort of thing. They, they seem to repeat names. Anyway, Lursa and Betor, who will talk a little bit more extensively about resurface. Although not officially the heads of the household, they found out about their brother's illegitimate son, Toral. Toral, although only a teenager, makes again a play for the head of the Klingon High Command. And, and yeah, they, they betray him and leave him because that's, that's Klingon politics and also that's, that's the Duras family. We also know that Lursa and Betor continued their brother's association with the Romulan Empire, receiving funds, weapons, and supplies to take over the Klingon Empire and put themselves in charge effectively. 
These two women, we'll get to in a moment, but they were basically running House Doros, even though effective, officially their brother was actually the head of the Doros house at the time. But we all know that Lursa and Bator were a literal force of nature and nothing was going to be in charge of those two women. They would get up to quite a lot of shenanigans. But again, we'll get to that. Their brother would reappear several years later, attempting to find the Sword of Kaelas, which had been taken by the Hook and somehow been ended up in the Gamma Quadrant. He would go after it, but he would be once again defeated by Worf, although he was not killed. He was, again, somewhat disgraced by this, but it only diminished the power of the House Duras a little bit, because, again, Lursa and Bator were really the faces of it. He was more of a puppet, and they treated him exactly as such. Now, getting to Lursa and Bator, they're never really seen separate. They always work together. They travel around on a old Klingon bird of prey, which somehow, to me, does reflect the diminished prestige of House Duras somewhat, that they don't have a more up-to-date Kavort class, or even a Katinka class cruiser, or a Vorchak class attack cruiser as their main flagship. It could simply have been a choice, that could have been their preference, but you're going to pick an old ship over a new one if you have the choice, really. I mean, you, you get yourself a good old Vorchak class attack cruiser, because they are the, the most powerful ship in the fleet at the time, if you have a choice really or at least you know a battle cruiser because more powerful it's bigger it's faster uh, yeah the bird of prey is stealthier but it's not even the best bird of prey they've got like the runt of the litter of the birds of prey which i've done a more extensive video on i'll remember to link it hopefully and yeah the two sisters though and their boob window were very famous throughout the Klingon Empire, and very well respected. Again, this is because most Klingons perceive them as this part of this noble, honourable house Duras that continuously manages to get the dirt wiped off its windows all the time when they're actually up to no good most of the time. So Lursa and Bator, with their boob window, do things like steal resources, plan assassinations, they indulge in espionage, consort with the enemies of the Empire, all right under the nose of the High Council, even though the High Council is aware of this. But they have to maintain appearances, because Gowron ultimately is a politician, and he knows that Duras is powerful. The people love them, and he can't move against them as much as he would like to. Now, the politicking and the insides of the Klingon Empire clearly has some effect, because they end up somewhat outcasts, but with a great deal of support. The two women have quite a lot in common, but also are quite different in personality, with one being quite assertive and generally more sort of pragmatic, and the other one being seen to be much more impulsive and less, less diplomatic, both quite seductive. For example, when Soren strikes one, she implies that he might better be initiating a mating ritual as this one is seen to be the more aggressive of the two sisters, and generally the more sexual of the two. Now, as stated, Lursa was the much more pragmatic of the two, probably the brains of the operation. That's not to say that Bator was not, but Bator was certainly more impulsive. She'd be much more likely to fire a spread of torpedoes and disrupt a fire at a problem, rather than sneak around and hide from it and figure out a problem, whereas Lursa was seen to be much more level-headed and a little easier to deal with and sometimes to a degree having to even keep her sister on a bit of a leash. I hope metaphorically only, but they're Klingons. Now, they eventually would, as I said, develop an association with an Elorian scientist known as Dr. Tolian Soren. Soren promised them a weapon, a trilithium weapon that was capable of stopping all fusion within a star. With this terror weapon, they hoped to reconquer the Klingon Empire and basically get it back under control as their last attempt when they worked with the Romulans and Sealer and blah blah blah, had failed thanks to Federation involvement, resulting somewhat in their, not banishment, but certainly becoming more outside of the Empire. But they saw this as their big win. He was going to give them this weapon. They had seen it work as they'd seen him destroy a star with it, and they wanted it. But he wouldn't quite give them the command codes to operationally run it, so they were still having to play diplomat with this Elorian, at least long enough for him to either get himself killed or get away. Now, of course, he would ultimately be killed and they will be defeated in the Viridian system after engaging in battle 
with the Enterprise D, but not before striking critical damage to the Enterprise, thanks to the again machinations of Soren managing to help them get the codes for the and frequencies for the Enterprise's shields, allowing them to penetrate. And I've done a whole video on that as well, which side tangents incoming. Seriously, Riker, just fire more phasers. It's a bird of prey, right? It's a bird of fucking prey. It is not that tough compared to the Enterprise. Your weapons are far more powerful than a 30-year-old ship, which is a tenth your size, right? Seriously. Riker. Off point. Back to topic. This would be, of course, the end of Lursa and Bator, but not before we did discover that Lursa was pregnant with a son. Now, in official canon, that is the end of what we know of the Duras family. The House of Duras does not end there. Of course, she does have a son, which is, as far as we know, a legitimate heir to the house, as well as Toral is still out there. So in Apocrypha, which is beta canon, which I don't overly cover, but we'll do the cliff notes. Toral does return in the 2370s, again, trying to take over the Klingon Empire with the help of Sela, but that is non-canon. Her son in some Apocrypha sources is known as Jarod, but he has never been officially named on screen. We know he exists, but that's all we know. There is the possibility that he could be brought in in, some, in a show like Picard a bit later on in the early 25th century, because by the time of the early 25th century, of course, he would be about a 30-year-old man. So very easily, the new head of the House Duras, if not the head of the Duras House, certainly its second, being the son of one of the most prominent matriarchs of the family. If his uncle hadn't killed him, or... Well, cousin, actually, it would be. If his cousin hadn't killed him, or someone else hadn't killed him, or his mother hadn't killed you know, it... It Klingons, right? The Duras family were, however, a very influential and powerful member of the Klingon Empire, who often held sway within the Klingon High Council. But with the death of the Duras sisters, and effectively the disgrace their brother was, and he wasn't, he was by no way near the tactician or soldier, or no one near as intelligent as his sister, as his aunt, rather, the likelihood that he would ever successfully take over the Klingon Empire was pretty limited. The only reason he knew about the Sword of Kalos is because he heard about it when he ran into the Dehar Master in a bar and he told him about it. And he thought, there's a good idea. If I get that, I can become the head of the Klingon Council. And he's like, no, you won't. No, you won't. Even Gowron will kick your ass. But shut up. But anyway, that is the House Duras and every known member of it to date. Now, there is indications there may be other members, cousins, uh, other children, legitimate or otherwise, that may exist, but there's no confirmation of this, so we're going to say these are the ones we definitely know about. And again, Lursa's son does exist. He, as far as we know, he was not aboard their bird of prey when it was destroyed. He was likely back on Kronos or in a Klingon outpost somewhere. But we don't know his parentage. We don't know, actually, if he perhaps ended up as part of a different house. Maybe his father's house. Unlikely, but possible. We simply don't know, and until he reappears and again, there is a good, strong possibility, and I don't see any reason why it couldn't be done, that he couldn't be brought in in a new story in the early 25th century. Because we now know what's going on in that time period, and we still haven't heard much of the Klingon Empire, and damn it, I want to know. War's still around. He is, after all, the scourge of House Duros, the slayer of Gauron, and, you know, he's Worf. He ain't going to live that down. Worf's going to take that blood feud to the grave. And I don't blame him. Because seemingly it's genetic in that family. Every single member of House Duros has turned out to be, quite frankly, a sleazy, traitorous, scummy person. There is, of course, the possibility that the innocent child born of Lursa could be better. Maybe his father was a good, decent man who would raise that boy to not be a traitorous worm of the Klingon Empire. But genetics, who knows? Let's see. I say, bring him back. I want to see a story involving him. I want to see more Toral. I want to see Jarrod if indeed that is what he's called, because again, remember that is Apocrypha naming. He could be called Duras again. They could rename him anything. 
they 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 could call him Paul, you know, the Klingon of House Duras. Why not? Good strong Klingon name. Anyway, that is the end of this video. If you enjoyed it, please like, share, and subscribe. And let me know in the comments down below any facts about the Duras family that I had to gloss over here for timing, which you felt should have been involved in this video, and whether or not you really would like to see a return of the Duras family. Do you think that that storyline is just buried now? It's been and done, and we're over it. Oh, is it something that is still unresolved? Because really, everyone that Worf had an issue with, Duras, his father, his sisters, hell, with the exception only of Toral, they're all dead. He shouldn't really have an issue with Lursa's son. But he might. It could be Lursa's son is holding a grudge against Riker. And, you know, he wants, I will have my revenge upon House Riker. Not that there is a House Riker, but from Klingon point of view, that would be how they would see it. Anyway, let's move on to the end of this video. Thank you for watching and bye-bye.